hello, I'm John Stevens. I'm the chair of the Federal Trust. And I'm talking again today to Brendan Donnelly, the director of the Federal Trust. Brendan, the, there was a curious juxtaposition yesterday between President Putin addressing mass soldiers um, in the Red Square and uh, President Macron addressing the European Parliament. Uh, his speech was quite significant, it seemed to me, in giving a very strong federalist vision for the future of Europe uh, in a number of very key areas. How would you see it? I think the juxtaposition was deliberate from the point of view of Macron, and certainly the French press and um, commentariat um, had been pointed in this direction. It happened, of course, on, on Europe Day. It reflected long-standing views of Macron's about the need for further European integration, and I entirely agree that it's a, a very federalist uh, agenda that he's setting out. He wants more integration on defence, on environment, or on energy. Uh, he wants a, a new treaty, uh, and above all, he wants to uh, uh, reduce and perhaps even eliminate the use of uh, national vetoes. He wants more and more decisions to be taken by qualified majority. What are voting. the prospects of him getting a good um, audience for this um, in other member states, particularly it, perhaps not, with Germany? The same day as he gave the speech, um, Macron travelled to Germany as his first national port of call, and he was clearly very cordially received. Um, his ideas were described as uh, interesting and worth um, following up on by um, Mike Schultz. Uh, there isn't uh, yet a complete meeting of minds, but both sides were very eager in their press release, press, conferences, press conference to, to stress the need for the Franco-German uh, entente um, to, to be developed and, uh, and carry on. Uh, and of course, uh, there are other big countries like Italy and Spain, which are very much uh, on the same line of, um, of uh, intensifying European integration as a result of COVID and as a result of what's happening in Ukraine. Ms. Draghi, um, the Prime Minister of Italy, um, was very much in favour of uh, ex extending majority voting and, and made this uh, a very um, central part of his recent speech. Uh, but do you think this is going to raise problems elsewhere, particularly in Eastern Europe, who are at the moment obviously uh, overshadowed by the, the, the war and um, all that that implies? It's certainly true that in, in Central Europe, um, there are more hesitations about uh, treaty changes. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're against um, further deepening of, of integration. It may be that the way the French make progress with their new agenda is coalitions of the willing, um, permanent structured cooperation, as the Lisbon Treaty allows. Uh, and that would permit them, significant um, groups of, uh, of EU states, to go further, faster, and within themselves use qualified majority voting. So it might even be that um, de facto we see a, a multi-speed Europe emerging. And then those countries in Central and Eastern Europe um, that are unhappy with that will be faced with a dilemma. Uh, are they going to allow the French and, and their allies to go ahead or are they going to be, try to be part of the, of the process and perhaps different countries will make different decisions? Well, coming back to uh, ideas of a multi-speed Europe, I mean, that's, those are notions that have been around for, for a long time, as, as both of us know. But the perhaps most striking element of that part of his discussion was the way in which he addressed the issue of Ukraine's future membership of the EU and recognizing that this would take some time, I mean, at least 10 years, he seemed to suggest, and that he was emphatic that uh, bringing Ukraine into the EU should not be done at the cost of uh, loosening in any way the criteria for membership and the conditions of membership. Uh, how do you see that? Well, he had tried, tried to square this circle by suggesting some sort of antechamber, some sort of revamping of the Council of Europe, um, not to have new institutional structures, but to have what he described a, a, a political community um, of countries that shared the values of the European Union, but weren't yet in the European Union. Um, and that is um, 
uh, probably not particularly welcome news to the Ukraine, particularly given the time scale that he's put forward. Um, but it, it is um, a forum that he's suggesting in which the Ukraine in particular could be brought closer to the European Union. He also, would also apply to the West Balkans, presumably. Yes, um, but even more interestingly, from our British point of view, he also mentioned the possibility of countries that had left the European Union um, becoming part of this political community. Um, I can't myself um, see it as going anywhere because the aspirations of the United Kingdom and the Ukraine are so different in regard to the European Union um, that there may be a microsecond where they find themselves at the same distance from the European Union, but um, Zeno will overtake the tortoise and um, Ukraine will not be in the same position vis-a-vis -vis the, vis -vis the European Union um, as is the United Kingdom for uh, uh, in well, any yes, I mean, I, future. I, I, I thought it was extraordinary that there's been no mention, as far as I can see, in the British media of what was really a very significant uh, gesture in the direction of the UK in, in um, indicating that this common European home that he was talking about to uh, accommodate Ukraine's status could also be um, available to the UK. But um, what, what was he trying to achieve by that? I mean, do you think he, 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 this was just a, a rhetorical thing or, or is there yeah, some yeah. ulterior motive? I don't think there's any particular ulterior motive. I, I think the, uh, the idea he has in mind is that when um, British commentators and British politicians say, um, you're so anti-British, you want to kick us out of Europe, you don't want to have any association with us, he has an answer. But I think it's a, a, an answer that's really not going to work, um, either from the British side or, or from the European side. But might it be seized upon by um, those elements in British politics? I'm thinking really of the Liberal Democrats, I suppose, but also some elements obviously in the Labour Party, who are hoping that there might be some way of um, getting back closer to Europe without having to grasp the nettle, as they see it, of... Uh, advocating any form of serious rejoin proposition. If this um, uh, political community is to mean anything, it, it must imply something in the way of economic political sovereignty sharing. Uh, and that's uh, the, the difficulty um, at the heart of Brexit, that the European Union is all about sovereignty sharing. Brexit was a, a rejection of sovereignty sharing. And it seems to me you, you're either in or out. You either accept that sovereignty sharing or you don't. Um, suggestions that there can be halfway houses like joining the customs union, joining the single market um, seem to me to be, to be wide of the mark. Uh, there is a logic in the hard Brexit of this, of this government um, because if you do stick with the single market and with the customs union, you are just uh, admitting in so many words the pointlessness of Brexit. One might uncharitably suggest that comparing uh, the UK to Ukraine, putting us in the same um, category, is, is somewhat insulting. Whereas, in fact, perhaps who the do? real comparison... Who do, by the way? To whom Sorry? is it insulting? To whom is it insulting? Well, to the UK, I suppose. Is it? Um, but, the, um, but um, of course, the, perhaps the real uh, comparison between the UK is uh, curiously with Russia, in the sense that both feel... Um, outside the the European idea, obviously in vastly different ways and with um, different consequences. But nevertheless, um, that is the more appropriate parallel because both ha have made, as you say, sovereignty the absolute uh, touchstone of policy. But there Where this is currently... Sorry. Significant. There is a significant difference, which may be what you're going to be talking about next, which is that the, U the United Kingdom until recently uh, was part of a sovereignty sharing organization. Um, and the consequences of getting out of that sovereignty sharing organization uh, are dominating British politics in various ways, and particularly in the case of Ireland, which is well, a, that's absolutely uh, right. I was going to come a consequence on to of Brexit, uh, where the, the, the intellectual and moral hollowness of Brexit um, is, is um, a paraded for all to see. Yes, I mean, that, that's absolutely right, because the other story um, recently uh, is, of course, the, the local election results and the election results in, in Northern Ireland, with Sinn Féin um, being the largest party, which is clearly a, a historic watershed of a kind. 
Um, and this has reopened, it appears, the, all the issues about the protocol. Um, the Democratic Unionist Party are refusing to participate in Stormont until the protocol is removed. We have Liz Truss suggesting that um, there will be moves to abrogate the protocol um, in some way uh, very soon. Um, at the same time, you've got some questions about whether a Sinn Féin victory really does constitute advances towards uh, the prospect of United Ireland or not. How do you see all those various strands fitting together? Well, with extreme difficulty, because they, they point in, in different directions. Um, my worry, anybody's worry ought to be, um, that the people who are dealing with these very delicate issues uh, are motivated by ideological considerations on the one hand and um, the need to maintain the support of, of the Eurosceptic press and the Eurosceptic backbenchers within the House of Commons um, and um, are dealing with uh, a set of circumstances which are objectively um, almost impossible to resolve. Um, the uh, road which the government has gone down already of pretending, of promising one thing to one set of uh, actors and something quite different to another is, it is an impossible one to unpick. Um, so uh, Pericles and Winston Churchill between them couldn't sort all this out. Um, the present Conservative government is e even less likely to be able to. But why is the British government so concerned about the protocol? Because I mean, one way of looking at these election results in Northern Ireland is, and this is confirmed by opinion polling on, on the specific question, uh, is that the protocol is actually accepted by a majority of people in Northern Ireland. And that, I mean, uh, obviously the DUP and uh, the TUV, the, the more um, radical unionist party, have um, uh, ideological concerns about it. But why should this drag the British government into it? I, what is it that about the protocol that worries the British government so much? I don't know it's, they've also demonstrated it throughout the whole Brexit process that they don't actually care very much about all that. Well, they care very much about um, uh, the performative aspect um, of Brexit, um, of sovereignty protection. Um, the, the, the Eurosceptic press between 2016 and, and 2020 um, focused very much on the supposed perfidy and uh, outrageous behaviour of the Irish government. Uh, and when the final Northern Ireland Protocol was signed, um, pretty definite assurances were given by Boris Johnson um, to the people from the backbenches in his own in his own party um, that it would be possible to set aside, renegotiate, nullify the the protocol. Now that was never on the cards, um, and his having given that promise um, was a, was was a rash one. Um, but he finds it difficult um, to emancipate himself entirely from that promise, um, not least because there's the need always to be throwing new red meat to his ultra Eurosceptics on his own benches and in his own party and in the Eurosceptic press. Um, the, the, the corner into which the government is painting itself for domestic political reasons, I don't even mean domestic reasons within the British polity as a whole, but within the polity of the Conservative Party and its media supporters, um, this corner is becoming narrower and narrower and narrower. And how it's going to resolve itself, um, heaven alone knows. We haven't mentioned yet the in role of the American government in, in wanting to keep the, the protocol show on the road. Well, quite. I mean, there seem to be so much, so many um, damaging elements for the British government in in pursuing this issue over the protocol, and and people have said that the British Conservative Party, um, with Brexit, has basically transformed itself into a kind of English nationalist party. But this is very much an English nationalist party. I mean, why it's is it's Ireland so significant? English nationalists don't ha like having things taken away from them. Uh, and while um, I'm quite sure that uh, the English national sentiment would very rapidly adapt itself to a united Ireland, the thought of losing a part of the United Kingdom is something which is symbolically quite powerful. I, I can understand in one way that there would be an irony in thinking that you are uh, uh, resuming your sovereignty through Brexit and then losing uh, an important part of the country over which this sovereignty, this regained sovereignty was supposedly to be exercised. 
But is not the real fear then perhaps not just Ireland, but what it might mean for Scotland, for example, that it might be possible that if the protocol was to be bedded down in Northern Ireland, that um, Scottish nationalists would then say, well, you know, we want the same sort of thing for us. Well, you talked about other parts of England, conceivably saying that. But you talked about the protocol being bedded down. That would take a, a few years. And I don't think this government is capable of thinking in its European policy in, in, in anything other than the very, very short term. It, there may be some people in the Foreign Office or the Northern Ireland Office who are aware of that possibility. But uh, I think the short term thinking of this government is what dominates its approach to Ireland as to all aspects of Brexit. Uh, to, to conclude, I mean, overshadowing all of this is, of course, the, the continuing war in Ukraine. And there does seem to be um, some hope in British government circles that uh, because of the British role in supporting Ukraine, um, our nuclear weapons, the supplies that we've been giving to uh, the Ukrainians, our place in NATO and the rest, that now is perhaps a good time to resolve some of these issues. I mean, it's been suggested that this push on the protocol is uh, going to be um, partly because the Europeans will not want to react strongly against us with any form of sanctions because of the Ukrainian situation. Do you feel that the, the length of time which the war continues and, and its evolution is such a dominant story that, that a lot of these other questions are going to fade until uh, or, or be pushed into the background until... Um, until we have some resolution? Uh, there may be some pressure for that to happen, some tendency for it to happen. Um, but I think that the, the, the British government has spent the past five years convincing itself that now was the time of maximum weakness of the European Union and may be able to impose their will on a disunited and incompetent European Union. It never worked before. I don't see any particular reason why it should, should work now. Um, that there is a view uh, in, in the European Union um, that the United Kingdom never intended to uh, implement the Northern Ireland Protocol um, and that the sort of blackmail it's attempting to exercise now is very similar on a much reduced and much more civilised scale um, and the blackmail that uh, Putin is trying to, to exercise. Um, if you believe in the rule of law and the observance of treaties, then the, the Northern Ireland Protocol is also a treaty that needs to be to be to be observed. So I, I think there there may be a little more caution on the European side, but I, I don't think they will uh, allow themselves um, simply to be um, steamrolled by by Liz Truss, who, who also herself uh, has aspirations of leadership, which uh, at the moment may well be uh, uh, influencing her approach to this issue. I think that's quite likely. Yes. Uh, well, I think that's very powerful though, to, to end on, um, the fact that issues of international rule of law are um, applied across the board, whether it be in Ukraine or in Northern Ireland. Um, Brendan, many thanks for this, um, and I hope uh, viewers found this interesting, and until our next talk. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed this latest video. It's one of a series of videos about Europe, about Brexit, and about the future of the European Union um, from the Federal Trust. Uh, and we hope that you'll subscribe to our YouTube channel, and then you'll have notifications of future videos, which I hope you'll enjoy uh, as much as perhaps you enjoyed this one.